Kitty seems better, at last. All of us are walking in the juniper woods, walking to see the tree that has haunted me for weeks. Mum and Dad are not happy about what's happened. A meeting was scheduled, but was called off when Emily finally admitted what she wrote in the thesaurus and how she tore it up. Mum and Dad filed a complaint. And Audrey and I are spending more and more time in the library as the weather worsens. And I asked Mr Allison for help in finishing my speech for the village hall meeting. Now, we all walk together, taking in the last days of autumn in Juniper before the village meeting. It's important that this doesn't happen again, Mum says firmly. I know, I nod. I shouldn't have hit her. I know that. That's not actually what I mean, Mum says. I know you're sorry. I know you know that's not how to behave. I know that what she did was awful. It was, Dad and Katie both say in chorus. She did that intentionally to cause harm, Mum goes on. If you'd done something like that to another person, I'd be very worried. It's true. It had never occurred to me to tear up someone else's things and write an evil word like that on the broken pages. She's targeting you because you're good, Nina explains. That's what bullies do. They try to make you feel bad about all the good things you have, the things that they want. It doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. Nothing about bullies makes sense to me. I think of the shame and the pain Nina had felt about letting her friends bully people while she had said nothing. I think of how the witches of Scotland must have felt as they were dragged through these woods to look out and see the faces they had perhaps known their whole lives. All those people, they stood by and did nothing, Kitty says. Not Audrey, I whisper. I think, Kitty kicks some pebbles out of her path, I'd rather be burned for being a witch than stand by and watch it happen. It's a very original book in, in that it highlights what life can be like for an autistic girl, uh, autism and girls being extremely under-researched un and underdiagnosed. But instead of going for a preachy angle or a pious, sad angle, it shows this, this young girl just trying to get through her life, go to school and deal with her family, much like pretty, pretty much any other child. And I'm excited to see what comes from author Ellen McNichol next. To be nominated for first book award at Scotland's National Book Awards is huge. It's a huge privilege. And um, I've been very lucky that Kind of Spark has won a lot of awards. But this award in particular, I think it means just that bit much more because it is from Scotland and it is a community of Scottish writers and Scottish creators and Scottish readers. And that, you know, this book gets talked a lot about being about neurodiversity and autism, but it is also a book about Scotland. I wanted to write about real Scotland and real Scottish people uh, in the modern day uh, confronting their history. And so it's incredibly special to have that this book be nominated for a Scottish Book Award because... It, it's so proudly Scottish. I mean, if you saw my American copy edits and how I was defending the Scottish terminology in this, you'll know how proud I am. Um, but yeah, it's it's so incredible to be nominated. It really is. Highlands and Ireland's hospitality is renowned. It's a shame the weather is not so accommodating, especially most of the year. Maybe our generosity is a form of compensation. We don't have double glazing and during the frequent winter gales, the sash windows rattle like a milk float down a cobbled street. Basins and towels are laid along the sills to collect and soak up the rainwater. The house has no insulation. Solid poured concrete walls are highly effective at conducting the cold and damp directly into the interior. The only heat source is the peat fire in the living room and all summer we are enslaved to peat cutting to feed it over the long winter. Every house and every croft in every village is shadowed with a long peat stuck out the back, a carefully constructed herring boned architectural feature. In the autumn, earwigs find their way into corners and crannies of the house, sometimes into your bed. Crabby, summer fattened spiders bounce in their webs outside. And on warm evenings, huge bomber moths thud against the window panes. The earlier houses, the Tehantu, the black, or more correctly, Tehantua, thatched houses, a double stone walls around a core of earth, a dense insulated thatched roof and deeply recessed windows, squat, hunkered, limpid houses glued to the land, off the land, impervious to bad weather, the cradle of the Cayley. An acquaintance who was born and lived his first six years in a black house 
recalls that he had never experienced cold, such as when he moved to the newly built White House on the Croft. Her cat sleep on top of the telly for warmth and under the copper hot water tank in the cupboard beside the fire. The hamster Harry dies of hypothermia in his tin box under my bed. I remember his cold little body curled in my hand, ordered by post. He had come all the way from Inverness, perhaps originally from Syria or Siberia, arriving one dark night on the ferry. For this, I always imagined him having had a little suitcase. Rory in Bleak is regaling you in the most interesting and fascinating stories about all the different parts of his life. Peter Capaldi appears, rock bands in Glasgow and the art school are all there. So anybody with uh, any connections at all, either to the Outer Hebrides, to Glasgow, to the punk and rock scene uh, through the 70s and 80s, this is definitely one to look out for. Well, it's it's up there with being published in the first instance. Uh, like I said, I, I had very modest aspirations for the book, but like last year was for the publishing industry was as with everything else was entirely hobbled by uh, by the pandemic, and the book was due to come out then. And uh, when it did eventually come out in October, November last year, it came in an avalanche of hundreds of other titles. So you could only hope that anybody was, it was very difficult for it to gain any attention or, or to get any traction at all. So by the time that uh, I got advised of this, uh, this possible award, uh, I had already written off that it was never going to make it to anybody's shelves unless it was by word of mouth or something like that. So it's certainly given me a, a great Philip, I must say. A spring and done frosted morning on the Devon, just a couple of days before the March 2020 coronavirus lockdown. Still air, azure sky and sunbeams brimming over the rolling horizon spilling forth a myriad of sparkling rays. Nature is so inspiring, life-giving and powerful in every way, and here by the river it was unfurling its beauty in such a spellbinding manner that tears welled up in my eyes. Naturally, my emotions were partly stirred by the menace challenge humankind was facing, but in a strange way, that was a positive, focusing the mind on what a wonderful world we live in. It also brought contemplation on my perception of the natural world and how it has changed over time. When I was younger, my brain was more scientific in manner, nature being something to research and study. Why does a fox do this or a crow that? Such an approach is without doubt important because the more we know about nature, then the better we can protect it. But as the years have progressed, my mind has also become more reflective rather than knowing why. For me, it is much better to enjoy. I wandered down to my favorite part of the middle river there were signs of spring everywhere, singing birds, frog spawn in a nearby frozen mirrored pool and silver furred catkins adorning the riverside willows. On the top of a high alder, a male song thrush with his pale speckled breast catching the soft sunlight sang his little heart out, a melody of ringing notes so true and sweet. Not to be outdone, down in among the tangled roots of a riverside alder, a diminutive wren shivered in the sheer passion of delivering magical music. I was absolutely thrilled when my publisher, Paul Philippou, phoned me and told me that I'd been shortlisted for an award. Um, as, as people might know, I'm very keen on wildlife and I was actually just about to enter the sea to go snorkelling when the phone rang, just as about to enter the sea in Mull. Um, and I couldn't believe it. Um, and I must admit, there, there were, was an odd tear in my eye. It was, it was say, very exciting. But I hope it also gives inspiration to other people, to other new writers, people who are thinking about writing, to pick up a pen and actually get writing, because um, the world is your oyster. Silt. It gathers in the riverbeds and basins of your hands. You hold it tight in your small fists. It is the tenuous grasp you have on the world and you resist when I try to loosen it. Asleep, I unfurl each newborn finger and with the tip of my smallest nail, lift the daily sediment away. Beneath the long lines of your life, your head, your heart run still and deep, your future, mapped out in miniature, 
tucked into the steadfast folds and creases of your palms. Mother Nature by um, Aoife Lyle was um, an incredibly powerful book. It was extremely moving to, to read it. I, um, I came to this not really knowing quite what to expect. I found myself blown away by the, by the visceral nature of the writing. It's an extremely moving and at times deeply um, upsetting book um, in the way that it beats its subject matter um, with loss, remembrance, regret, longing and grief. These are all extremely powerful themes. And I think that Aoife presents them in a way that is both powerful, but also accessible. It feels absolutely wonderful. Uh, I mean, as you can tell, I, was, I wasn't I was born here. I was born and bred uh, in Dublin, in Ireland, but I've lived in Scotland since 2010. And, you know, this Scotland is where I became a mother. This is, this is where I was pregnant. This is where I, I gave birth to my children. And that has a, had a very profound impact on, on my writing. And it, and it did a huge amount to make a new place home. And to, to have that, you know, to have that scene and recognize and, and to have the shortlisting say, you know, you've, you've, you've got it right, you've got a sense of it is, is enormous. Doing this for the first time was terrifying. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. Um, but, you know, as I said before, we've got a lot of, of, of pictures and, and um, I, I just slowly put things together. Dad left a huge archive um, of things. I mean, I think it's 50, over 50,000 items of different things. So it was, it was jolly hard to pick and, and choose and God bless him, he never threw anything out. Um, and uh, it, it was quite hard to try and choose all the stuff that I did already in this book. I feel very humbled that anybody would even think about having me shortlisted for this book and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very gracious for that thought. The Daisy Bean Wee Neds and a gang, I'm long gone. People her age are moving on, getting on with their lives. We had police officers, trainee teachers, and all manner of good professions accepting people our age. What are we doing? Still hanging on to something that was already behind us. Sitting with our old school pals, drinking, taking drugs, chasing that old buzz. It's an ideal, a nostalgia, collective loyalty and belonging. The notion of that collective union has slipped away from us. Those who keep chasing it beyond our age are trapped. And never Neverland forever. I dream back to the days we all saw around a wee fire with the bottles and the troops out there. That was the start of all this. But something's changed and gone sour along the way. What happened to all my old pals? The ones that used to mean something? And what promises did the next stage of life offer? To keep going down this road to nowhere, a deeper darkening of everything that had come before. To get a skin bird pregnant and doom your wains to the same inescapable cycle of degradation, acceptance and repetition. I don't want that. The Young Team by Graham Armstrong is sweaty, spiky, candid and alive, wrapped in the immediacy of youth. Its subject matter and use of Scots to tell the narrator's story, based on Armstrong's own experience, set this book apart and made it stand out to us. It means I'm going to be shortlisted, you know, I, th I think when you're you know, being shortlisted and nominated for prizes and winning prizes, it carries a responsibility because there's other young working class men in my community that, that are me, you know, and that that's not their life course. So you become inspirational in that way, you know, and it's, uh, it's a responsibility as well as an honour. So both, you know, they act accordingly.